Mic check. Everything's yeah, going. Forward. Okay, very good. All right, so we're moving forward in our Matthew study. Matthew, we're in Matthew 10. We're going to branch off into Matthew chapter 11 since we've already looked at the beginning section of Matthew chapter 11, our sermon for last week. But we left off in our Bible class in Matthew 10, 32 through 34. <laughs> Whosoever therefore shall confess, and you can... Uh, Insert the word in this text, as the American Standard Version does. Whosoever therefore shall confess in me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth, I am come not to send peace but a sword. We mentioned last week the importance of the words whosoever. Jesus is leaving the invitation or the opportunity for anyone to come and confess in him to anybody that will do it. And so that goes against the Calvinistic idea that there's a select few or select group, the elect, that are the ones that will be able to confess. Jesus says, no, whosoever will. Everybody has the opportunity, but we are quickly learning in this section, Jesus himself is teaching that not everybody will. It's only those that are going to realize their great need that have the characteristics of Matthew chapter 5, the Beatitudes, and we see that contrasted throughout our studies with the Pharisees, Sadducees, and those of the Jewish system that view themselves as being self-righteous. They have everything that they need, and thus the king comes, Jesus comes on earth, and they don't, are not willing to uh, receive him. They don't need him. And we made mention of the fact of just how important the confessing in him or in Christ is other than just the simple verbal going through and confessing with the mouth. Now we understand Romans 10, 9 and 10, that confessing with the mouth is a requirement, but is it simply enough to confess with the mouth? I mean, we have people all around us that are ready to confess with their mouth that yes, Jesus is Lord, but are they really confessing in him? And thus, we're, we're saying this is a point of identification. This is discussing or describing a location. I'm confessing in him that this is where I am. And I'm striving to live like he is living. And thus, you have the contrast in verse 33. Whosoever shall deny me before men. In the American Standard Version, there is no inclusion of whosoever shall deny in me. Because you can't do that. If I am actually in Christ and I'm living the way that he is supposed to live or that I'm supposed to live, then there is no way to deny in him. But if you are going to be a person that's just going to deny his very identity and the rule and the control that he actually has, Jesus then in turn says, him will I also deny before my father, which is in heaven. So we have conditions based or being placed upon us being received by the father. If I will confess in Christ with the mouth, with my actions, then Christ will confess me before the Father, and the Father will receive me. But the other case is true as well. Well, if I'm not willing to confess in Christ, if in fact I will deny Christ, and Paul wrote to Titus how that in fact we can, uh, we can confess him with our mouths, but in our works, in our deeds, we actually deny him. And we refuse him. If I deny Christ, I'm not living the way that Christ said I'm supposed to live, then he in turn will deny me before the Father. So my acceptance with God is dependent upon these actions. And which it's, um, it's interesting how that everybody will be willing to accept, well, yeah, your bad deeds will keep you out of heaven but nobody's willing to accept, well, your good deeds will help you get into heaven. It's interesting that one can keep you out, but one can't, you know, gain you entrance. If one can keep you out, then the other's able to allow you in. And Jesus himself is saying so. In verse 34, think not that I'm come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Now this, 
even though this verse is very simple and very plain as to what's being presented, it helps us to also better comprehend and better our ability, interpretation, and being able to study. When we have this verse saying, think not that I'm come to send peace on earth, is that a blanket statement? Is this just a cut and dry statement? He didn't come to send peace. All right, we've got to know why. Why is that a no? Okay, because you have in other passages, and particularly throughout the book of John, you have it continuously being mentioned on how that Jesus came so that we might have peace. All right, and John 14, 15, 16, given of the comforter, he says, I'm my peace, I leave with you. That's one thing that the denominational people, they use that one over there about bringing peace, but they don't ever bring the sword one into right, the Right, right. Even though you try to point it out, they say, no, just bring out the good. Why do you guys always have to bring out the bad? Because oh. it's there. Okay, so even with that John statement where he says, "I, you know, my peace I leave with you, is that all Jesus came to do was to bring peace? No, you've got to balance it out. It's not a contradiction, but you have to understand that when he is saying here, think not that I'm come to send peace on earth, this isn't his only job. I've not come to send peace only. I came not to send peace only, but I also came to bring a sword. And it depends on which category you are in as to where you're going to be. If you're going to be a person that will confess in him, what will you get? You'll get peace. But if you're a person that's going to deny him, what will you get? You'll get the sword. And that's what Paul wrote to the Corinthian brethren in the second Corinthian letter, how that they, in coming and preaching the gospel, it's both the savor of life and it's the savor of death. Well, how can that be? It's one, you know, one thing that you're doing. It's just the gospel that you're presenting. How can it have two different smells? It depends on the person. And Paul says that much, that to one, it is a savor of life to those that will receive it, but to the others, the savor of death to those that will refuse it. And so is the category here. If you'll receive it, it's peace. If you will not receive it, it's sword, it's punishment, it's destruction. 35 to 37, for I'm come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Now we'll go on to the next one just so we can get this other the other verse where this is used, and he that taketh not his cross and falleth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. So three times Jesus makes the statement that in fact there is going to be a group of people that are not worthy. What does that do to the mentality that many people have today that Jesus Christianity is just all inclusive. Just everybody is being brought in as you are. Not according to this, Jesus in fact is being very exclusive. He's drawing a line and he says, if you're not willing to do this, if you're not willing to love me more than these, you're not getting in. You're not gonna be included here. You're gonna be excluded from the group. Now, again, with this section, we cannot look at this and say, well, okay, this is the only thing that Jesus came to do. I've come to set a man at variance against his father, the daughter against the mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. That's, that's just what Jesus came to do. No. He is describing specific events in a specific context, and he is showing what the possibilities are. This is a possibility of what's going to happen as they go out to teach and preach and as we go out to teach and preach. That your enemies, your foes, shall be they of your own household. But just as this is true, is not the opposite just as true as well? That while Jesus is saying, okay, the, your foes are going to be they of your own household, 
But the opposite can be true, too, that, you know what, an entire household can end up obeying the gospel. Now, where do we see that actually taking place? All right, Cornelius and his household. Jailer, Acts 16, the flipping jailer and his household obey the gospel and have their sins forgiven. Including little children. Including little children. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you see, you cannot take this and isolate it, divide, you know, end up dividing everything up to where you end up being a contradiction to everything else that's being presented. And you have some people that, could, that would, in fact, argue that way. That just here's what Jesus says. They do not take into consideration any of the other gospel accounts or anything else that takes place in the book of Acts. And it's just, here's where their mindset is. This is what's going to happen. This is how it should be. And it's just, you can't study that way. You cannot leave this out here on its own. Now, this statement, very, as, we're sta as we're studying it, this is a very true statement. Just how many individuals end up not obeying the gospel because of family ties? Well, I don't want my mom and dad to be mad at me. I don't want my grandparents to be upset with me. And they know what the truth is, and they set it to the side because they're not willing to go through this. I had a Bible study with a guy um, where I used to work in California, and I got him to see the Bible and that there was only one church and that you needed to be baptized, and that it was the Lord's church. I got him to see it, but because his family was Catholic, he mm -hmm. could not get himself to do it because they would disinherit him. Right. That, that is sad. I mean, yeah. you go through all that work, teach people to then have it just be watered up and thrown away, and it's disheartening. And I'm sure if we, like with that situation, if we got other brethren in here that are actually involved in going out and doing the work of the church, they could tell us similar stories. Um, I know that I've already told you guys about the story about the daughters in the islands that they came to the Bible study and they were ready to obey the gospel. And they, they said before they obeyed the gospel, they knew their dad was going to beat them. And sure enough, they obeyed the gospel and they went home and he beat them. And they, but they were willing to endure that because of what was being taught to them. They realized it was the truth. There was no denying it. So what if? I mean, you can't deny the truth, and it's just, well, this is going to be the outcome. All right, so be it. And even in doing some extra reading uh, through some other sermons and class material, came across uh, one brother's class material, and he actually told a story of a young lady that was like in her early 20s, came to study, she realized the truth, but because of fear of what her family was going to do, and like you, like uh, Adrian was saying about being disowned and kicked out of the house, she said that very thing, you know, I want to obey the gospel, but I'm afraid of what my parents are going to do, that they're going to disown me. And so the brother said that he took her to these passages and said, well, Jesus knew this was going to happen. And we recognize that, that this is going to happen. And he told her that, okay, they may, t they may kick you out, but I am assured that we have some brethren here that will take you in. That you may lose one family, but you'll gain another. And I know they say blood is thicker than water, but when it comes to the spiritual family that we have, that is supposed to be stronger than blood. But unfortunately, with that, uh, with that uh, brother's uh, story, and situation, as far as he knows, she never obeyed the gospel because of that fear. Jesus was already warning them here that this is going to happen. And he says, he that loves father and mother more than me, if you have more reverence and more fear for your physical parents, you're not worthy. Those are strong words coming from the Savior, who wants all to be saved. But the reality is that you're not just coming in here any way that you want to. you got to come in through this means, and in doing this, you're going to make enemies, but it'll be okay. We've already discussed last time how that he's already made mention of. You don't fear those that can destroy the body, but fear him that's able to destroy both body and soul in hell. And that's where our concern should be, not with the physical, but with that of the spiritual takes a step further, and well, not even a step further, this is all connected, and that all of this is wrapped up in this, taking up your cross. 
you're willing to sacrifice all of this. You're willing to put yourself out there so as to ultimately be a martyr. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me. So there's that confessing in me. You're not just doing it with the mouth. You're walking it out. You're living it. If you're not going to do that, the third time he says, you're not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. This is where life is. And all of this is discussing what it takes. It's what's involved in becoming a Christian. I give up my life, and I give it over to Christ. That I'm dedicating, I'm devoting myself, my life over into this cause. So it very much is just like the physical military. When you sign up for service, what about your life? Not yours anymore. You belong to the military now. Anything else you were concerned about before, you might as well forget about that. Nobody cares about it. This is what your focus is. Getting yourself ready to go out and to do the work. So is the life of a Christian. You are giving your life over to service. You're signing up. You can forget about everything else. Forget about your mom. Forget about your dad. Forget about what's going on back home. This is where your focus is. And this is what it takes to have this life. Now, this is really backwards to how most people consider about what it means to live, right? If you want to live a fulfilling life, what do you have to do? You got to go out there and get. Go out there and get, bring it all in. But Jesus says, no, if you're willing to give up, if you're actually willing to sacrifice, that is how you gain. It's addition by subtraction. Sounds like a Connor uh, puzzle trying to figure it out. And most of the time when we're dealing with biblical principles, with godly principles, that's how it is. It's a, uh, you know, it's a paradox. It's things that align that don't make sense. Just like what he says about becoming the greatest in the kingdom. How do you do that? Weak. By becoming weak. Well, that's backwards. If you want to be great, you got to gain power. You got to gain position. You got to take what's yours. Not according to this. That's not how we're working. Everything's working reverse. You want to find life, you got to be willing to lose it. You got to be willing to sacrifice and give up. And that's the reason why so many, even inside the Lord's church, many of our brethren, why they are not living fulfilled Christian lives. It's because they're not sacrificing. They're not giving up. And they're not actually practicing what it is that the Bible that Jesus himself is calling us to do. And he that loses life for my sake shall find it. In verse 40, he that receiveth me, yep, he that receiveth, or excuse me, he that receiveth you receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. This ties in very well with John 20, 21, as Jesus is preparing to leave this earth, and he's getting his apostles ready to go out and to do the work. Then said Jesus to them again, peace be unto you. So there's another one of those peace passages, even though he says he didn't come to bring peace. All right. Clearly he did, but it's not only peace that he brought. As my father has sent me, even so send I you. Here we have the chain of command. But not only the chain of command, but we also have been given to us. What does it take? What does it mean to receive Christ or to receive the Father? It's right here in verse 40. He that receives you receives me. What does that mean? Are we literally receiving Jesus? Okay, Jesus, I receive you. What's happening? All right. Okay. 
don't forget our context. We've been discussing the limited commission, great commission. How does one receive an apostle? Through the teaching. Through the teaching. If I, so let's just, let's diagram this out. The apostles roll into Ronan, and we are supposed to receive them. What are they coming into Ronan to do? Preach and teach. So if I'm going to receive an apostle, I need to listen and obey his teaching and his preaching. Okay, Jesus says, anyone, he that does that, what does that also include? You receive Christ. So how is it that a person receives Christ? Through the teaching. It's all pointing back to the Word. That's important because everybody has this mystical and spiritualized idea about receiving Christ and what that means. It's very simple what it means. You're listening to what He says. And it's no more than that. It's not difficult. It's not some mystery. And it's not some personal event that happens differently for every single individual. Everywhere the apostles go, and when they receive the apostles and listen to their teaching, you're receiving Christ. So, Christ, so we're seeing right there, Christ does not have to go into every single city so as to have people receive him physically. Wherever his teachings go is where he goes. And wherever his teachings are being received is him being received. So we're looking past the messenger to the message. He that receiveth you, he that receives your teaching, receives me, and he that receiveth me, receiveth him that sent me. All the way up to the Father. So even as we're going through and we're reading this information, this is not the message of Matthew. This is the message of God. Matthew is just simply writing it down. But if I receive what Matthew wrote, who am I receiving? I'm receiving Matthew, I'm receiving Christ, I'm receiving the Father because he's the one that gave the message. And this really is the battleground where we are desperately needing people to submit to, is that when I take an individual to Scripture, I'm not taking you to what Matthew said. I'm taking you to what Christ said. And I'm taking you to what the Father gave Christ to say. But too many people want to look at this simply as, well, that's just what Matthew said, or that's just what you're saying. No. Jesus says, if you will receive what the apostles said, you're receiving me. So if I take you to the Bible, and you'll listen to what it says, you're receiving Christ, not some man. So, here, so the message is being given by revelation. We know that from John 17 and... Also, what Paul said about himself in Galatians chapter 1, how that he did not receive this revelation by any man, but he received it by Jesus the Christ, and that he was taught directly. <clears throat> so then you have the apostles. They went out, and they preached it, and they taught it. But we also have them writing it down. So to receive these words is to receive the apostles, and to receive the apostles is to receive Christ. And to receive Christ is to receive the, receive the Father. But just as we said, it all starts with the Word. It starts with the message. And then Jesus takes a step further in verse 41 when he says, He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of the disciple. Verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. <clears throat> so in this section, we have further illustration or a, 
an expansion of what a prophet's job or a righteous man's job is. That not only are they going out and teaching and preaching, but just as Jesus was involved in doing similar work, you have them fulfilling the physical needs as well. Here's somebody that's thirsty. You do not get to neglect that and ignore that because you're out here doing this other work. But then you also have it on the flip side. You have most individuals today, let me just ask it. For most individuals today, when they consider the work of the church in evangelism, which one are they focused on? Are they focused on up here, teaching and preaching a prophet, receiving a prophet, or are they focused on cup of cold water? Today, individuals want to look at this and say, well, this is the most important and this is what we're doing, so therefore we get to neglect this. No, you've got to take them both together. You have got to take all of this that while I am teaching and preaching, yes, I need to be mindful of the physical. I can't push that to the side or ignore it. But at the same time, I cannot do this because this is, if you consider it, this is a lot easier than having to teach and preach somebody about their sin. Why is that that the denominational world, they do it every single time. They'll take one and knock the other. Or we're to believe we baptize, mm. repent we baptize. Right. And every time they always take one but not the other. We say that it takes both. Or all three or four. Well, not to get too far ahead into our gospel meeting topic, but that's a Pharisee mindset. That I can do one, and because I'm doing one, I can ignore another. That's exactly what the Pharisees did. Or, just like the Pharisees, we can do this one because it gets us more attention. It makes us more popular. Uh, we'll, you know, we'll fill up backpacks full of school supplies and you know, give them to all the kids and all that kind of stuff, which is fine. But that can't be your main focus. You know, that can't be the one thing a year that you're doing and saying that you're doing the work of the church. Because that one thing isn't going to get them to. Exactly. That one thing, and now, I mean, certainly we can use that to our advantage because we're showing to them that we care about them. We are concerned about you, and we, we hear about your situation, and we want to fulfill it. But we do not simply want to fulfill your physical needs. We want you to get to this also. It's like, hey, we've met your needs physically. Now let's try to focus on your needs spiritually. And the two must go hand in hand. So there's that picture and explanation that's being presented to us, but then we also have an anticipation of the end of the apostleship and the end of miraculous works because he starts out discussing he that receive a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. All right, that's miraculous ability. A prophet... One that's able to prophesy, that's one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But then notice how he transitions. He transitions from one doing the work of a prophet, and now, and he that receiveth a righteous man. Well, who's a righteous man? That can be anybody, right? Doesn't have to be somebody endowed with miraculous gifts. What, what about when it comes to the work of the church? Is it just left to some special category? Or is it not open to everybody? It's open to everybody. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man or authority, strength, power of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. So what about this mentality? Well, you've got to go to some special school and be some type of special person so as to be able to accomplish anything inside of the Lord's church. Being able to get a reward. You've got to have some big name. You've got to have some big ability. It's not true. Even down to just being, you know what? You're just a good person. And you're just simply going about and doing what God says that you're supposed to do. What about your reward? You're going to get a reward too. You're going to be rewarded. And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water, 
only in the name, notice, of a disciple, not a prophet, not an apostle, of a disciple. Verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. Now, Jesus has already made mention back in Matthew chapter 5 that even when it comes down to the least of the commandments, you do not break that. You do not try to set that aside. You do not try to look at it as being less important or insignificant to where I don't have to do it. And then he brings this into discussion, giving one of these little ones something so simple as a cup of cold water. Think about the simple act of giving somebody something cold to drink. I mean, that's, that's easy. Anybody can do that. And since that is easy, and that's open for anybody to do, where do we put that on the scale of importance? Is that on the high end of importance or on the low end of importance? It's on the low end. But notice how Jesus elevates this to the high end of importance. So what about the things that we would think are insignificant? We better pump the brakes. And we better reconsider just what we're, what we're trying to do. Now that's important because we have those in the religious world that are doing that all around us, are they not? As long as we agree on these major things, we can disagree on these minor things. Who set you up to determine what's major and minor in the sight of God? Because here's Jesus looking at a cup of cold water, and I, might, I look at that as a minor thing. But he says, oh no, you better do it. So what about these things that the denominational world views as minors? You don't get to determine that. God is the one that gets to set the standards on what's major and what's minor. And even with the things that he says, even the things that he labels as being least, Matthew 5, he says, okay, these are the least of the commandments. Do you get to ignore them? No, you still have just as much responsibility to do those as you do these major things. And even Jesus brings this up again in Matthew 25, where he gives the illustration of those that will be separated on his right hand and on his left, those to receive a reward and those that will be punished. Who are the ones that will be punished? the ones that did not give a cup of cold water to those that needed it. So what about us trying to decide, well, that's, you know, that's not that important. That could very likely come back to get us when we stand before God. Now, what is it that causes, a, you know, causes individuals to look at these things this way? When you take a Pharisee, and why would he look on somebody that's asking, let's, you know, let's not, even, not, not even take it to the extreme of somebody who's just who's begging for cold water. They've not had water in days. You just take somebody that's out doing some work and they're coming around. It's like, you know, you got anything, got anything cold to drink. What would cause a Pharisee to refuse that? It's a heart problem. Huh? Because it wasn't one of them. Okay, because you're not part of my group. Nobody's around to watch. Nobody's around to see me actually do it or not do it. What can I get in return? All of those things start coming into play. But then you take the opposite side of that. You take an individual. They're not the mentality of the Pharisee. <clears throat> But we have a lot of people that they are just, they're self-defeating. Like they just look at themselves as though there's nothing good that I can do anyway, so why do it type of person. To where all of these things start coming into play and all of those things end up putting us in a position to where we're going to lose our reward. So Jesus says, when you did it unto the least of my brethren, you did it unto me, Matthew 25. How much attention 
does God give to what we do? And that's the other side of this coin, the other side of this teaching. We look at this as insignificant and we would say, well, who's even watching? Who's even paying attention to this? More than likely, nobody, except for the person who's in need. They're going to appreciate it. But this is also showing that even when it comes down to the things that we would view as being little and insignificant, there's a reward for that. And who gives the reward? God gives the reward. So God is watching these little things that we do or don't do. Right. Goes right back to the no-name individuals. The they that let the man down through the roof. We have no recollection, no idea who they are. Nobody to give praise to. But God's going to reward them. And that's what Jesus already said in Matthew chapter 6. Do these things in secret and your Father will reward you openly. Well, just imagine having your house, though, and someone breaking your roof open. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So everybody's got to try to be on the same page, right? Everybody's got to try to be on the same page. But even with these things that we view as insignificant, we just need to do it. Because we're servants. That's what servants do. We're not looking to be rewarded. We're not looking to receive a thank you. You just do it because it's right. Right. Jesus washing feet, uh, John 13, before the Passover and before he is to be crucified. Yeah, the, the one who's needing the most attention at that time, and he's giving attention to others. So God pays attention. He gives great attention to these little things, and yet we pass by doing these things because we say to ourselves, what difference will it make? We downplay it. But there's nothing that goes unnoticed in the sight of God. There's nothing that happens or does not happen that God does not see. As Jesus already said inside of this section, he sees the sparrows. He knows the hairs on our heads. And so what about when it comes to the little things that we do? Oh, he's watching. He's paying attention. But just as we said, it's not our place to determine what is important and not important. Because even with what God labels and what Jesus describes as being least in the kingdom, he says you still got to do it. And when it comes to this little thing of giving somebody as simple as a cold drink of water, still need to do it. Because there's good in it. And wherever there's good, I mean, just raising the question, what would Jesus do in this situation? If Jesus would do it, then what do I need to do? I need to do it also. If I'm going to be found to actually be confessing in him. Okay, so that ends Matthew 10. Questions, comments before we move in this stuff into 11. Okay. All right, let's close that and get 11 open. Now, we've already looked or studied together the beginning section of Matthew 11 and looking at John in prison, sending his disciples, asking the question, and we dealt with that and how we are to deal with doubt and how it is that God views us when it comes to our doubts. But as we're going through Matthew chapter 11, we also find different attitudes and how to react to them. Not only how does God react to them, but how should we react to them as well? So we've already considered John. John is in prison. What is his attitude? How's he feeling while he's in prison? He's discouraged. He's down because he's the forerunner of Christ. He's come preaching judgment against those that are unrighteous and the removal of sin and the remission of sins for those that will be righteous. The coming of the kingdom is also included in that message. And here's John in prison. Again, as we said, going through the Bible and viewing the teachings of Christ and, the Christ and Christianity and how things are going to play out, this is way backwards to how I'm sure John is considering and even how most Christians today think a Christian life should go. 
I'm doing what God says to do. I shouldn't be here. But he is. And no surprise. John, you're a prophet. What did they do, what did they do to the prophets before you? They yeah, stoned them, put them in prison, killed them as well. This is not out of the ordinary. But we can start looking at our situation as being out of the ordinary. And that's where we get ourselves in trouble. Oh, this has never happened to anybody before. Oh, really? You think you're that special? That you're being punished in some special way? 1 Corinthians 10, there's no trial that's taken anybody that's not common to man. But all of this is going into play. Now, how did Jesus react to this? Huh? Oh, you think so? I'm sure most of us would have been. This is aggravating. This is embarrassing. Here's my messenger, and he's coming and he's doubting me. There's good comfort. Just as we considered with the man, Matthew 9, the man being let down, the woman with the issue of blood, twice in that chapter, be of good cheer. Be of good comfort. And that's what Jesus does with John. No severe rebuke, no chastisement. The message that's sent back to John through the disciples, trust in what you know. And John knew what the prophets had said about the Messiah. John knew about what they had, what they had mentioned, what God had mentioned, that the Messiah, the Savior, is going to do as he comes. The blind are going to receive their sight. The lame get up and walk. The deaf are made to hear. And Isaiah even prophesied, they will have the truth preached to them. And Jesus sends that message back to John through his disciples and says, trust in me. Trust in me and trust in what I am doing and that is fulfilling what the prophets had said. You drop down to verse 12, after Jesus gives the discussion or he gives the uh, response to the multitude so that they properly understood what was happening, <clears throat> you have been continued in that discussion, verse 12, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. Now, what's this about? What does Jesus mean that until now the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and that the violent take it by force. And to give you a hint, think about the questions that Jesus has just asked the multitude about John. He turns to the multitude and he asks them, what did you go out to see? A reed shaking in the wind? What did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothing? What did you go out to see? What were they looking for? Okay, they're thinking physical. And so when it came to John, Jesus asking those questions, all right, you had something built up in your mind that when you went out to see it, that's what you were looking for, but is that what you got? No, that's not what you got. So what would they then try to do? Would they take John as he is? Or would they try to turn him into what they wanted? I think they would turn him into Absolutely, they would try to turn him into what they wanted, and we see that going on today. What are people going out and hoping to find with Christianity? Health and wealth? Prestige? Position? Preeminence? A happy-go-lucky life? A life without responsibility? All right, so the very same questions that Jesus is asking that multitude, we can ask the multitude today. What are you, what are you going out to see when it comes to Christianity? 
Well, with what people have in mind about Christianity, is that what they find? No. So what do they do? Christianity suffers violence. And the violent take it by force. Kind of happens on a small scale. When, whenever we're on the internet talking to people, they have a preconceived notion of what their belief is, and then we try to show them what the truth is, mm -hmm. and then they attack us. Yeah. And because they don't want to hear it. They want to hear that there's something to do. I've already got my belief that there's nothing to do. Jesus has done it all. So quit telling me that there's something to do. So it goes back into what we're discussing in Matthew chapter 10 about taking isolated passages and trying to build that into everything that it is. I mean, if we wanted to, we could take Matthew chapter 10 by itself and just make Christianity all about violence, unrest, the sword, and all that kind of stuff. And some brethren do that. With, and leave out completely the other side about how we're supposed to be peaceable. That, that is not the overall design of the scriptures. Although that would be a good way of teaching, now that you're saying this, I've never thought of that before. What's that with the sword? Yeah, uh, if you go back there and then you say, you say, let's just use this for instance, and then you say, let's take the sword, let's just take chapter 10, let's try to make it into something. And then show what you just said, the violence and everything, and say, is that all there is? No, and then you can do the other side of that and show this other side, but they have to both come together. Yeah. I mean, that would be a pretty good way. To, I've never thought of that. You get, you're you've got to make everything piece together. And so even when it comes to this situation here, you have similar language being used in John 6. And I thought I had it here in... Okay, I meant, uh, did I skip... Get things out of order. All right, let's do it this way. They were trying to seize on John and turn him into what they wanted. Okay, John, we know what the, we know what the Old Testament prophets have said. Elijah's supposed to come. He's supposed to be the forerunner, supposed to prepare the way, establishing this kingdom. Okay, we have a preconceived about what the kingdom is. John shows up. John, you're not exactly fitting into the mold that we thought. So we're going to try to shift you around. You're this wild man that's living out in the wilderness. Not too crazy about that. We want to try to change you into something else. Can't do that. John is who John is. And he's preaching what he's preaching. You can either take it or leave it. Suffereth violence is the Greek word biazo. To force, reflexively, to crowd oneself into, or passively, to be seized. So you're taking this person, you're seizing upon them, but it also has the idea to crowd oneself into. So it's a multitude that's pressing in to something or into someone. Take it by force, or podzo, from a de derivative of 138, to seize in various applications, to catch, catch away, to catch up, to pluck away, to pluck up, or to pull. You have the similar words, or the, or the same words, used in John 6, 15. Jesus has just gotten done fe uh, feeding the multitudes. And after feeding the multitudes, it says, When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force, to do what? To make him a king. He departed again into a mountain himself alone. They wanted to make Jesus into what they wanted. Okay, Jesus, we see the good things that you're doing. We're going to take you by force and turn you into a king. Let's just remove Herod from his palace and we'll put Jesus there in his place. But it says Jesus departed and he left them alone. Why? Because that's not what he came to do. There is the context and there is the idea. 
here's John and he's preaching what he's preaching and you don't like it. And what are you trying to do? You're trying to manipulate it. You're trying to turn it into something else, trying to turn it into something that doesn't fit. And just as we've already asked the question, we've already answered it. How much of this is still going on today? That they are seizing upon Jesus and how are they trying to make him? What are they, what are they trying to turn him into? Earthly. An earthly king. Something physical. I King. Right. The Jews that... Yeah, Jesus himself was not even willing to do what supposedly pre-millennial people say that he was coming to do. If that really was Jesus' plan, then right here he should have said, okay, see, they're ready to accept him. So this whole idea that, yeah, the Jews just always rejected, oh, no, there was a huge class of people that said, okay, yeah, we'll make him king. And if that's what Jesus came to do, he should have just stepped right on into it. So, yeah, that's a very good point. But Jesus denied it. He said, no, that's not what I'm here to do. So you have that aspect of it. But just as we said about Jesus bringing a sword or Jesus bringing peace, what do people try to do? How do they try to take Jesus by force and turn him into? They want to take all the peace passages and turn Jesus into, into a hippie. Love, not war type deal. No. You do not get to prey upon him, seize upon him, and turn him into something that he's not. He's a lamb, but what is he also? He's a lion. And so many people want to seize on with the lamb, the lamb, and they try to ignore the lion. What are you coming out to see? What are you hoping to find? And individuals take hold of the scriptures, they take hold of religion, they take hold of Christianity, and they twist it around to what they want. You got to take it as it is. He did not come to be an earthly king. He did not come to be only a lamb. He did not come to only bring peace. He also came to bring a sword. It's either Mark's account or Luke's account actually says he came to bring division. To divide people. Either you'll follow me or you won't follow me. And if you're not going to take all of that and you're going to start picking and choosing, you're going to get yourself in trouble. And that really is a difficult part that we are in is because we are coming in trying to bring in the full picture of who Jesus is and how do people want to label us. Legal, legalists, Pharisees, you're just unloving. No, you just thrive on this violence, on this unrest. It's like, no, I don't thrive on that. But I realize that it's included. I don't try to ignore it. But that's what the religious world does. They try to ignore it. And they try to wash it away. And it's just, oh, no, here's what Christianity is. Well, that's what you wanted to see. But in really looking at Christianity, it's not what you see. It's not what you find. But people are taking these things by force and twisting them around to what they want, making the king into what they want. Verse 9, but what went ye out, so as we said, but what ye out, went to, for what went ye out for to see? A prophet, yea, I send to you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it was written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Now, we already looked at this last time, but I want to make sure that we're connecting it to where we need to go. Verse 13, 14, 15. Verse 10 is a quotation from Malachi 3.1. Matthew 11.13, Jesus takes it a step further and he says, For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you will receive it, this is Elias or Elijah, which was for to come. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now, why is this section so important for us today and so important that people do not miss this fulfillment of prophecy? Because we have a section of the religious world that still says this is not fulfilled, right? 
They're still looking for this to happen. Who are they? Well, all right. Anybody that has a premillennialist view, we're still waiting for this earthly kingdom. The kingdom can't come in until Elijah comes first. Well, what has Jesus just said? He is Elijah. Jesus has just said, John is Elijah. So what about the fulfillment? It's fulfilled. It's done. Move on. It's happened. And this ends up leading even further to better understanding the revelation. Because many people want to look at the revelation as though it's prophetic, just, you know, purely prophetic of future events, when in fact, the revelation is describing things that have already transpired. And that is especially the case when you get into sections like Revelation 11 and 3, where you have mention of the fact, and I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. Just about everybody in the premillennialist world recognizes one of these witnesses as being Elijah. And that's where they get messed up. Is well, yeah, okay, the, the revelation says we're still waiting for Elijah to come. But what has Jesus already said? Elijah has come. So what about this section in Revelation 11? It's already been fulfilled. We're not writing of something prophetic. We're writing about something that's already happened. It's given the timeline, leading them up to this destruction that's happening, which inside the Revelation, most of it's describing AD 70. Not only that, but when it comes to the second witness, most would recognize that as being Moses. Moses was a prophet. I will give power unto my two witnesses. They shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. But hasn't Moses already come? Deuteronomy 18, 17 through 18. And the Lord said unto me, Moses, they have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Hasn't this prophet already come? Acts chapter 3, Peter says, that's Jesus. Jesus is this prophet that is like Moses. When it comes to Elijah, when it comes to Moses, they've both already come. John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah. Jesus is that prophet that is raised up like unto Moses. And they've already done their work. So this is Moses, this is Elijah, not coming in the future, but just as Jesus is speaking. Elijah has already come. He said that in Matthew 11. Now what about Moses? He's already come as well, not literally. So even right there, we're getting further bi biblical interpretation and how to properly study. Are John and Elijah the same person? Is John really Elijah? No. They are two separate people. But they are the same in purpose. Purpose, identity, mentality, characteristics. So what about Jesus? Is Jesus Moses? Literally? No. Office. Work. They're coming together and they're in the same likeness. And even when you take into consideration Revelation 11, 7 through 8, when it talks about what's going to happen to these prophets and when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. What happened to John? The beast shall ascend and make war against them and thou shall overcome them and kill them. John was beheaded. What happened to Jesus? He was crucified. He was killed. Where was he killed? Their dead body shall lie in the street of the great city. Both were killed in Jerusalem. 
So even when we're getting into this section about the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them. If this is John and Jesus, so when does this take place? Not future. It's happening with those prophets, with those witnesses. The battle that's taking place, even Jesus makes that very same statement in Matthew chapter 12 when he talks about when he cast out the devil and they say, well, Jesus did this by the power of the devil. And Jesus' response is, how can a man go in and devour a strong man's house except he do what? Bind up the strong man. What did Jesus come to do? Jesus came to do war, to battle against Satan. What we are seeing in the life of Christ is this battle being played out. And that Jesus won the battle. And in winning that battle, what has he done? He has secured for us a way out. He has secured for us a way of redemption. Now, even in this context, look, so notice what's happening here. The beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Now, that doesn't fit into the situation of Elijah. What's Elijah's end story? What happened to Elijah? No, no, I'm talking about, I'm talking about the literal Elijah. So here the prophecy is, or, or the revelation is mentioning that they will kill him. Elijah was taken. Elijah didn't die. And what about Moses? Well, God didn't kill him, but Moses died in the land of Moab. No, Moses wasn't taken. Moses died of old age. He lived a full, a long, full life. Nobody killed him. So this doesn't fit into the descriptions of Elijah and Moses. And then on top of that, even if Elijah and Moses, uh, Elijah and Moses, Elijah and Moses, if this is talking about them and they came back, how would they die? They wouldn't come back physically. Matthew 17, we have Moses and Elijah coming back. They didn't come back physically. They came back in a spiritual body. How do you kill a spiritual body? You don't. None of that fits into the equation. Now, that's a bit of an excursion. I mean, not a bit. Definitely a rabbit being chased, but it's one that needs to be chased in, in the context. So that we make sure, just as Jesus said, he that hath ears to hear it, let him hear. We need to make sure we hear this. And that we place it in its proper context, in its proper timeline. Now, what's also interesting about this is here's Jesus saying about John, yeah, John is this Elias. He is this Elijah. What did John say about himself? Well, he did say that. But John is questioned by the Sanhedrin, by the Jewish court. And they're asking him, are you the Messiah? And they ask him right out, are you the forerunner? Are you Elijah? Anybody remember what John said? No, you don't remember or is no his answer? <laughs> in John 1 when John is asked are you Elijah John says no I'm not now what about all of that here's John and he's a prophet but he even says it himself I'm not that one but then Jesus turns around and says that he is
is there some type of problem? Or is the problem possibly with how we would look at that and how we would consider it? What about the information that these folks are getting? How is it coming to them? All right, through preaching from God. But are they able to look at these events? They have the prophets. Are they able to look at the events the same way that we are? How are we looking at these events? All right, looking back, but all right. John is living through it. This stuff is being revealed in real time. But we are able to look at this from the standpoint of, I don't know, 100 yards back, and we get to see a bigger picture that's being played out. Whereas they're going through it in real time. And it's, okay, John makes the statement of, all right, I'm, no, I'm not Elijah. All right, no big deal. even when it comes to the apostles and them trying to learn what they're trying to learn. We look at the mistakes that they make and we're ready to give them room because what? Okay, they're learning it. We need to do the same thing when it comes to John. All right, let's go easy on John here. He's learning it firsthand. He's living through it firsthand. Now, what about when it comes to us? Just as we said with these characters in one of our previous classes, I think, um, I think Jamie made mention of it. These are real life people. These are everyday people. And even though John is a prophet, what about the prophets? They didn't have it all pieced together. Even Peter writes about that. The Old Testament prophets desired to look into the things that they were prophesying about. And here's John going through it in real time, and he's trying to process it. He's in prison, and he's trying to process it. And man, the doubt is growing. That's fine. But let's go back and let's reaffirm what we have here. Let's go back and study, and let's look at it again. And see what the prophets are telling us, and see if this doesn't fit. And certainly it fits when you have the Son of God saying, this is it. Just like Peter in Acts chapter 2, quoting Joel. And he says, this is that. Well, guess what? There's nothing else. You don't get to take that and then try to apply it somewhere else. If this is it, then that's it. It's done. And you don't get to look for it any further. So it's the same thing with Elijah. I'm not looking for Elijah today. Elijah's already happened. Come and gone. He's done his work. And because of that fulfillment... That is to produce further trust in me and what God has said. If God can accomplish this, then what about everything else he said that he can accomplish? It's a done deal. So that's dealing with John and the multitude and Jesus then transfers over, he transitions over to the, another attitude that we'll have to look at later. But he transitions back into dealing with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And we get to see, we get to learn about the contrast of attitudes. Why is it that John received the reaction that he got and then the Pharisees continue to receive the reactions that they get? Because it's a difference of attitude. It's a difference in why they're asking the questions as to how they end up being received. So we'll stop there. Any questions, thoughts, comments on John in prison, the response that Jesus gives, what Jesus has to say about Elijah? All right.